economic crisis, marine life washing ashore, hotels empty. What caused this mass devastation? Was it an oil spill? A hurricane? A nuclear disaster? A megalodon? Nope. This stuff. Algae. Kind of like this algae. Except not the same species and a lot smaller. Have you ever seen a pond or a lake with a really thick green paste? Well, that's likely an algae bloom. They happen when there's plenty of nutrients around like nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. Now these nutrients occur naturally, but they also show up in our water bodies as runoff from agriculture, industry, our yards, our streets, even our dog poop. You would think that nutrients would be a good thing, right? But sometimes too much of a good thing, kind of like chocolate cake. Well, when these nutrients wash away, they typically end up in a water body where algae might just start to feed and grow. Now, algae is a natural part of our ecosystem. In fact, it's a really important part of our entire planet. Over millennia, 70% of our oxygen has come from algae, but it can also be harmful. In healthy ecosystems, when additional nutrients are added, these algae blooms can start to form and affect the entire food chain. When algae blooms do form that thick green paste that you see, it can block out sunlight, preventing photosynthesis from occurring in the organisms underneath the water. And when these species die, that process can uptake oxygen, causing something called dead zones that are really harmful to the aquatic life that need oxygen under the water. But then there's those species that are actually toxic. <laughs> In the 1500s, a Spanish explorer traveling through the Gulf of Mexico stopped in Florida. In search for food, they found oysters. What they thought was a miracle ended up not being so much. The oysters were contaminated, sickening most of the crew. In 1844, the harmful species of phytoplankton, Karenia brevis, was officially identified, linking back to the stories of Spanish expeditions. Now, one of the species we have down here in Florida is called Karenia brevis. In large concentrations, it's called Florida red tide because from far away, it kind of looks red. This species lives in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a saltwater marine species of phytoplankton. The toxin that's released can harm aquatic life, but what makes this species so unique is that the toxin can actually aerosolize. What that means is that it attaches onto salt particles in the air, moves on shore with winds, and causes respiratory irritation like coughing or sneezing in healthy individuals. But for those with asthma or other respiratory illnesses, this can be really serious. <coughs> now we have another species in Florida, and that's called Microcystis. Now that's a freshwater cyanobacteria species, and this species is found all over the world. And you know that really thick green paste? It's likely one of the species in there. A resident submitted a report of respiratory irritation and sent me pictures of signs of red tide and cyanobacteria. Both of these species living in the same place at the same time? Seems impossible, right? Let's go find out. I got here, I saw signs for both red tide and cyanobacteria. Now they exist at very different salinities. I feel a little respiratory irritation and we are, we are not right at the mouth of the Clusahatchee, we are up on the Clusahatchee. So right now we're gonna go check out what the salinity is because we know that Karenia brevis, red tide species, lives in marine systems. I do feel like a scratchy throat, um, but I'm not coughing. It's not reading. So we're going to take our sample back to the lab and test it with, well, with calibrated equipment. Um, not that this isn't calibrated, my interns are wonderful and they did a great job. Um, we just want to make sure that, that they did a great job. 
Lauren is my intern biologist, and right now she's working with Habsville. This allows trained volunteers to basically take samples, put it underneath the microscope, and an algorithm in the app calculates the concentration of red tide by its shape, size, and movement. Oh, wow, look at these two. They almost seem like inseparable. Looks like they took a liking to each other. Let's go get some samples. This water is so dark. Got the sample. So as we learned in episode one, dark colored water doesn't necessarily tell us much. So we need to see underneath the microscope if in fact this is red tide, but I'll tell you what, if it is, this is extremely high concentration. I'm thinking that it's probably dark colored from organic matter, but we'll see. So Karenia brevis cells are very sensitive. So when there's wave breaks or, or weather like we just experienced, those cells can lice. And I wouldn't be able to see a lice cell underneath a microscope as good as I can see a full cell. So we're gonna go out there and see if we can get a better sample of any Karenia. So I need a piece of string. Mm -hmm. Innovation. Right. Oh, this should be interesting. Going fishing. So there, there's a lot of something. There's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in here. The color that we're seeing mm -hmm. is not from red tide, or we would see crazy high amounts of Karenia in the sample, and we're, and we're just that. not seeing that. The bottom line is that's not what our water discoloration is from. All right, so you see that one there? Yeah. And that one there. There's a lot of space between those two. Do you know why algae couples drift apart? No, why? Because they prefer planktonic relationships. Oh. We went and took samples, looked at them underneath the microscope, and didn't see Karenia brevis. However, we know that there is a patch of Karenia brevis in the mouth of Clusahatchee, in the marine environment, in salinities where it can exist. Aerosolized toxins can move on shore with winds, so it's very possible that that's what we're experiencing, the effects from a marine red tide bloom. You can obviously see all the cyanobacteria here. A lot of the cyanobacteria gets pushed into these canals where there isn't a through way. And, uh, wow. Can you feel the respiratory? Yeah, oh my God, totally. Okay, so this is, this is a prime sample that we're going to analyze back at the lab. Wow. So just like we saw at the beach, I'm not seeing any Karenia brevis, the, the, species commonly known as red tide, but I am seeing something called microcystis. Now this species is known to cause fish kills and has caused drinking water problems around the world. But up to this point, we haven't known this toxin that's released called microcystin to actually aerosolize like the toxin from red tide. When we brought these samples back to the lab and opened them up, we experienced respiratory irritation right away. The reason why this is troubling is because if this microcystin aerosol is causing this respiratory irritation, this toxin has been linked with ALS and Parkinson's. And as you saw, we broke into someone's backyard to get the sample. So we know that these people live there. They don't have that choice to get away from the beach like, like many beachgoers do with red tide blue. In the late 19th century, settlers came down to South Florida to realize that the land that they purchased was swamp land. They needed to build houses and farm. They realized that a huge lake in the middle of the state drained down into the Everglades and then out into the ocean. And they realized that putting a big dam on the south part of this lake would allow the land to dry so they can start using it. So that's what they did. In 1928, a hurricane event came, broke the dam, and thousands of people lost their lives. The Army Corps of Engineers was called in to fix the problem, and that they did. So now, when that water gets to a certain water level, it is released to the Caloosahatchee River on the west and the St. Lucie River on the east. 
Lake Okeechobee is known for its annual cyanobacteria blooms from legacy nutrients within the lake, but also from the high amount of nutrients flowing to the lake from agriculture, urban, and residential developments. In June 2018, water was released with a cyanobacteria bloom to the Caloosahatchee River, filling the river and canalways where people live and going out to the Gulf of Mexico where there was an existing Florida red tide bloom present. Florida declared a state of emergency. This is something that's preventable. Cyanobacteria blooms are an ecological response of nutrient input, but the way that we have managed our land causes for high velocities of runoff at low water quality, causing erosion and, and of course, cyanobacteria blooms, among other problems for aquatic life. Because of the way we've managed our land, covering it with concrete, we've disrupted the natural water cycle. Rainfall that once infiltrated into the ground, allowing for natural treatment, now runs off surfaces through pipes at high speeds, untreated into our natural water bodies. The way we can combat this is through low impact development retrofit. So taking the impervious surface like concrete, asphalt, and disconnecting it. So basically taking that water that went from your roof down a gutter to your driveway, down to a pipe network and straight into a natural water body and disconnecting them. So taking that roof water and putting it in a downspout in a cistern so it time releases into a rain garden, for example, allowing that infiltration of that water, that natural uh, biological, chemical and physical degradation of that, those pollutants so that we have cleaner water reaching our natural water bodies. Did you know that every drop of water that falls on the ground in the state of Florida ends up in our natural water bodies? Our stormwater does not go to a wastewater treatment facility, nor does it go anywhere else except to our uh, natural system. So it's, it's up to us to make a change, to come together and improve our environment and in our public health uh, for future generations to come.